uh, sit down and find your seats again. Good morning to you. Um, uh, lost property, we've got a lost property table in the hall. So when you have tea and coffee uh, in a little while, visit the lost property uh, 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 space. There's umbrellas there. Uh, there's, that's the usual thing, isn't there? There's um, rucksacks there. Um, uh, there's even an iron on the lost... <laughs> Why there's an iron that's lost in Lansdowne, I don't know. But anyway, if it's your iron and you've lost it, you can find it at the, uh, on the table. Uh, do, do you know what really excited me this morning, though, was that I found my Bible. I, I've, I've, I've lost this my preaching Bible for the last three or four months. That's why the sermons have been rubbish. Um, <laughs> but now I've found it again, and I'm really excited, really excited. So you see, it's worth visiting the lost property department um, at the end this morning. Well, here we are. It's Pentecost Sunday, and our theme, as you can see on the screen, is the Spirit of God. Let me begin with a quote. There are some who believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Mother. Those who believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Scripture. Those who believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Church. And even those who believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Minister. So wrote Dorothy Sayers, the novelist in the 20th century, a generation or two ago. And I think her point is, is a good one. And the point is simply this, that the Holy Spirit is often the displaced and replaced person of the Trinity. Of course, we might want to argue that in certain Christian traditions, there's an overplay of the Spirit's role. But if, frankly, there's a danger for us in our tradition, it's probably in the opposite direction. We underplay the importance of the Spirit, and we can get a little bit spooked by talk of the Spirit's power and gifts. Well, here we are, therefore, on Pentecost Sunday, and it provides us with, I think, a valuable reminder that Christian worship is expressed through faith in one God, Father, Son, and Spirit, and that that is a basic foundational belief. And therefore, it's really good that this morning that the who, the what, the why of God's Spirit is the first in our new series called Foundations the foundations of faith. Let me give a, a quick book plug. If you want one book to accompany the series over the next uh, couple of months, then this is it for me. It's Jim Packer's Knowing God. It's still, in, in my view, one of the best primers on the, on the basics of Christian belief in God that there is out there. And, and we've done a special deal with the Keith Jones Bookshop and so you can pick up a copy, pay for it, pick up a copy uh, today uh, or in the next couple of uh, weeks. Thank you, Darren, for doing that. But that's Jim Packer's Knowing God. I'd advise you to read that and get a copy if you haven't already. Well, what is important about Pentecost? Two, two big points as we get going this morning. Two big truths. The first is this. Pentecost is a reminder that the church is a supernaturally endowed community. You see, when we forget that, when we forget what we are, we become perhaps little more than a well-oiled business operation or a kind of dry theological institution. Yeah, we have to be, we have to be uh, organized, we have to be educated. But Pentecost tells us that above all, we are a dynamically inspired and spirit-filled body. We owe our life and our identity to the presence of God. You see, we, the church, we are the only organization on earth which can claim God as CEO. Maybe I can't be the only one in Lansdowne who gets to the end of a week of ministry that's full of church meetings and committees and discussions. And you think, is this what it's all about? We have our processes sorted. We put together our, our systems and structures. We write our policy and position statements. We plan our budgets. And yet, the moving, energizing, creating spirit of God can be just a kind of footnote in the week. You see, folks, what does it mean for us here in the Western church 
in a church like ours to say we believe in the Holy Spirit? What difference does that make? Does it actually change anything? Would we be willing to stop the church bus in order to engage God and, and listen to him? Would we allow God's spirit to get a word in among our countless agendas and action columns? Hey, there's nothing wrong with efficiency. There's nothing wrong with a, with, with a business plan. There's nothing wrong with a marketing strategy. But folks, if, if we are a supernaturally endowed community, if we say we live and breathe as a church dependent upon God's spirit, then where's the evidence? Where's the proof of that? That's big truth one. Big truth two, Pentecost tells me that not only is the church a spiritually endowed community, the Christian is a spiritually, supernaturally indwelt person. You are supernaturally indwelt this morning. Are you, are you aware of that? Are you conscious of that? You are not normal if you are a follower of Jesus. There's something profoundly different about the Christian believer. It's not that we've kind of added church to, to, to the list of things that we, we do during a week. It's not that we've added a, a sort of moral framework which makes us more generous, nicer people. It is so much more than any of that. The Spirit of God lives in those who call Jesus Lord. You know, we, we, we sang a, a line in, in, in that first song right at the top of, of, of the service this morning. King of kings, majesty, God of heaven living in me. Hey, stop the bus. Do we have any idea what we are saying? Say it again. Sing it again. King of kings, majesty, God of heaven living in me. Now, Americans would call that awesome. We Brits simply shrug our shoulders and move on. But it is, is it not, the most staggering statement imaginable that the God of the universe, this indescribable, uncontainable, untamable God, lives by his spirit in people like us? In everyone who has turned to trust Christ? The spirit of Jesus dwells permanently and personally in you. So that means, folks, that you don't have to soldier on in life, battling with stuff that is too much for you. There's you plus the Holy Spirit of Jesus in you. That's the deal. You are a supernaturally indwelt person. All right, that's, that's starters this morning. Let's get to the main part of the menu. From this passage, uh, at the end of John's Gospel, chapter 15, through to verse 15 of chapter 16. Let me give you first the key texts, the key texts that we've got here. Well, let, let's locate ourselves in the plot line, in the narrative of the Gospel. It's supper time in Jerusalem, last supper time. So what would have been a, a normal meal between Jesus and his friends is anything but normal. As they eat and, and, and drink, Jesus turns the conversation towards some pretty heavy stuff. He talks about having to leave them. He refers to one of their number betraying him, another denying him, all of them deserting him. You see, you see that's the, the highly charged atmosphere and that's the emotional thread that runs through many of the phrases of the text. Uh, for example, the beginning of, 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 of uh, chapter 16. All this I have told you so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is offering a service to God. Strange words. Many well-specced 
modern cars have what is called now an HUD, a heads-up display. The technology is brilliantly clever, projects a small image onto the, onto the car windscreen, telling the driver at what speed he's driving, in which direction he's, he's going, even what radio station or music he's, he's listening to. It's very clever. It, it stops you having to look down. You keep looking up the heads-up display. Much of, of, of the text of chapters 14 to 17 of, of John's gospel performs that kind of function. It's a heads-up display for the disciples. Jesus is preparing them for some tough times to come after he leaves them. But it all gets too much for them. They, they are speechless. So Jesus has to kind of drag it out of them. He says in our passage, none of you asks me, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with sadness and grief because I've said these things. That is hardly surprising. I mean, coping with change is never easy, is it? And, and this was clearly going to be a significant transition for these friends of Jesus. But as far as he's concerned, this change was going to be beneficial for them. Uh, the, the message on the heads-up display wasn't just a warning of the devastating emotional loss they would suffer. No, no, out of that, beyond that suffering, their relationship to Jesus was going to change for the better. One of the key phrases, one of the key texts in the passage is this, it is beneficial for your good, he says, that I am going away. I tell you the truth, verse 7, it's for your good that I'm going away. But how can that possibly be good for them to be abandoned by Jesus? You see, it's that painful and disturbing context that these texts about the Holy Spirit are, are, are placed within. Because, of course, the coming of the Spirit meant that Jesus wasn't, in fact, leaving these disciples at all. He, he must leave them in order for them to enjoy a new kind of relationship with him. As he says in the rest of verse 7, unless I go away, the advocate, the advocate will not come to you. So from some of the key texts, let's think secondly about some of the major terms. Uh, there's only one really we need to focus on this morning from the passage. It's that term in verse 7, advocate. It, it, it appears at the beginning of, of our section. You see, verse 26, when the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth. It, uh, the term, the word advocate, first gets a mention if you flip back in your Bibles to chapter 14 and verse 16. This is where Jesus first introduces the idea. In all the grief and strangeness of the conversation, he, he says this in verse 16 of chapter 14, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. Again, in verse 26 of chapter 14, he refers to the, the coming of the Spirit. All this I've spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. So, so here's the major term, Advocate. It's a term which, notice, describes not so much who the Holy Spirit is, but what the Holy Spirit does. One of his primary functions, he's to be the advocate. The term in the Greek is parakletos. It's a kind of compound noun in New Testament Greek. Para means to, 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 to be with or to be called alongside. Kletos is the verb to call. Put them together, literally, the paraclete is the one who is called alongside. You see, that, that's the role of the Spirit in the life of the believer. In legal language, the Spirit is your defense attorney, your lawyer, your barrister. He comes alongside 
to help. His work is advocacy. That's what Shane Edwards, one of our mission associates, is, is doing right now in Mozambique with the Lawyers Christian Fellowship. She arrived, uh, uh, I think, about a week or so ago, and she's settling in, although she's praying for a shower head. She's got a great little house, but there's no head on the shower, so she's asked to pray for a shower head. But her role is to be an advocate on behalf of those who need her help in justice and land rights issues. Now, if you, if, if you are using, and we read from it, the older version of the NIV Bible, you will have read there, as Emily did, the term counselor for the word advocate. Whereas the ESV and the New King James Version, well, they use the word helper for parakletos, which just goes to show how Bible translation isn't always an exact science. It's more an art that words change their meaning. So you've got advocate, you've got counselor, you've got, you've got helper. I, I mean, take, take for example the, the word that the old King James Version used to describe the Holy Spirit. You may be familiar with it. The comforter. That's the word. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another comforter. Of course, comforter is, is often the word that we use nowadays when referring to a small child's blanket or their favorite toy. They are inseparable from it and derive enormous emotional security from holding onto it. My grandson, Morgan, he has a very unusual comforter. It's a guitar, a small plastic blue guitar. He carries it with him everywhere he goes. He doesn't play it. He can't play it. He just holds on to it. At mealtimes, guitar has to be with him in the high chair. Guitar goes to bed with him, into the bath with him, in the car with him. It is Morgan's parakletos, his comforter. Caris, on the other hand, well, she has a rabbit. Not a real one, you understand, but a soft toy one. She calls Hop. So whenever she needs consolation, Whenever she's near to tears or she's just tired and scratchy, you'll find her sucking Hop's ears. Now, when the translators of the old King James got to this Greek word parakletos in their manuscripts, they reached for the dictionary of old English words, and they picked that word, comforter. Now, at that time, in the 16th century, it meant putting heart or courage back into, into someone. I guess that's what Hop does for Caris and guitar does for Morgan. The rabbit and guitar put courage back into my grandchildren. Uh, take a look at this on the screen. It's a scene from the Bayer Tapestry, which is sort of the cartoon chronicles of the of the Norman conquest and the Battle of Hastings. We've got Norman soldiers, you see, on horseback gall galloping one way, in fact, away from the battle. And there's, in the middle, this character, Bishop Odo. He's, he's the one in the middle, uh, sort of wielding a giant baseball bat above his head. And he's aiming, if you look at it, he's aiming a vigorous blow or two at the soldiers who are rushing past him. And the caption in Latin, above, you've got a little bit of it, but you can't read it all, simply reads this. The bishop comforts the troops. Now, most of us would probably feel that is the sort of comfort we could do without. Give me a rabbit or a guitar any day. Not a bang on the head. But you can see what the... King James Bible translators were trying to say about the Holy Spirit in the use of that word? He's our comforter. He puts heart back into the mind and will of the Christian believer. He says to us, I am here to help you face the battle. I'm going to put courage back into you, strengthen you when you are weak and vulnerable. You see, that's, that's part of the role of of the Holy Spirit in, in, in your life and mine. When we don't feel like following Jesus, when in fact we want to run away, along comes the Spirit and says, you can do this. We, we can do this together. 
That is what Pentecost is all about. Giving people like us strength to speak and live for Jesus. Now, stay with John chapter 14 and, 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 and verse 16. Because there's another interesting term. A second term, a really important element to the ministry of the advocate. It's the reason why Jesus keeps telling these disciples, you're going to be better off after I've gone. And I will ask the Father and he will give you, here it comes, another counselor, another helper, another advocate, another comforter, another. (laughs) These disciples are going to get not just one, but two comforters. Do you remember that scene in the Mad Hatter's Tea Party in Alice in Wonderland? The March Hare asks Alice, would you like some more tea? To which the always correctly spoken Alice says, but you can't have more tea unless you've had some already. That's the meaning here. The disciples already had one advocate, one helper, Jesus himself. But now he's going and they will have someone else in their lives with that role too, his spirit. You see, in New Testament Greek, there are are two words for another. There's the word another of a different kind and then the word another of the same kind. And that's the word Jesus uses here. The Spirit is another of the same kind. Instead of one paraclete, they will have two. More of the same. You will have me back, says Jesus. Listen to him in verse 18 of chapter 14. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Everything that Jesus had been to his disciples, their friend, their guide, their teacher, the Holy Spirit would now be. Instead, therefore, of being poorer for his departure, these people are going to be richer. And richer in one very special way. Listen again to verse 16 of chapter 14, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter to be with you forever. Forever. No more coming and going. Jesus, by his Spirit, with them forever. So do you see what Pentecost tells us? That just like the first disciples... We do not have a lesser experience of Jesus because he is not physically present with us. We actually enjoy a new level of intimacy with him because the Spirit of God is the Spirit of Jesus. Another comforter, another of the same kind. Me, he says, I will come to you and this time I will not leave you. I will be with you forever. So, there's the texts, some of the key ones, the terms, some of the major ones. Finally, the big truths. Now, for ease of memory, there are four, I think, in our passage, and they all begin with S. Spotlight. The spotlight ministry of the Holy Spirit. This is featured in two places in our passage from John 15 at the top and at the bottom the top 15 and there verse 26 when the counselor comes whom I will send to you from the father the spirit of truth who goes out from the father he will testify about me and then and then the bottom of our passage Chapter 16, verse 14 and 15. He, the Spirit, will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. That's the Spirit's role. 
The ministry of the Holy Spirit is, is, is self-effacing, not self-promoting. Uh, the Spirit's role and purpose is to throw the attention, throw the focus onto Jesus so that everything the Spirit says and does has one aim, to make Jesus, God the Son, known and loved and worshipped. That's what God's Spirit is all about in your life and mine and in the church. The Spirit wants to get right out of the way so that Jesus can have the glory. He points us to Christ. He forms Christ in us. That is the Spirit's wonderful spotlight ministry so that we can see Jesus more clearly, love Jesus more dearly, follow Jesus more nearly. So here we are on this Pentecost Sunday. Go to the Holy Spirit, will you? And ask him, Spirit, show me more of Jesus. Spirit, make me more like Jesus. Those are the sorts of prayers that the Holy Spirit loves to hear and will always answer. That's his role, to spotlight Jesus for us. Secondly, sonship, or for the women, daughtership. In other words, the Spirit of God wants us to know that we are in the family of God. That's where we belong. That by virtue of our faith in Jesus, God is our Father, King of heaven, majesty. The Spirit is absolutely committed to, to, to you being more secure about your status as a child of God. Back again in chapter 14 and verse 18. Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans. No, I will come to you. And on that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I'm in you. You see that triple lock security? It's the Spirit's role to assure us that we are locked in to the love of the Son and the Father forever. So the Spirit of God makes possible the experience of the love of the Father and the Son in the heart of the Christian believer. You know, good old Prince Charles has so many titles. He is heir apparent to the crown, obviously. His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, he is the Duke of Cornwall, he is the Knight of the Garter, he is Colonel-in-Chief of the Regiment of, of Wales, he's Duke of Rothersey, he's Knight of the Thistle, he's Great Great Master of the Order, he's Grand Steward of Scotland. But what do William and Harry call him? Just Dad. Dad. When the Spirit of Jesus comes to live in us, how does he teach us to address God, the creator of all things, the alpha and the omega of the ages, just Abba. That. The experience of the 18th century Methodist reformer and Christian leader John Wesley is really quite helpful here. Wesley was religious, oh boy. Was he religious? He attended church three times on a Sunday while at Oxford. He took communion every weekday. He gave most of his money away. He visited prisons and workhouses and orphanages. He set up charitable organizations. But he didn't have a personal relationship with God. Then, in his own words, his heart was was warmed by the Spirit of God. His chains of religious duty were thrown off. He experienced grace and forgiveness. Things were different. And commenting later in his life on that transformation, he observed, I exchanged the faith of a slave for the faith of a son. That's what the Spirit does. He turns slaves into sons and daughters of God. He tells us, you're in the family. God is Father. Third S, third big truth, is service. By which I really mean mission. But that doesn't begin with S, does it? So it's service. 
The Spirit, says Jesus, at the end of chapter 15, is sent by both the Father and Jesus the Son into the lives of disciples who are then sent out into the world to do what the Spirit does about Jesus, testify to him. This is the, the mission of the church, the Christian. For we have a missionary God who sends his missionary son and his missionary spirit to create a missionary people who are sent into the world to make missionaries. My friends, mission is the inescapable agenda of the local church as it is of every Christian. We are to go and tell. And it's the spirit who's the driving force behind this movement into the world. For that's our direction of travel. We're on a mission, fired by the Spirit. And we will find that as the Spirit of God drives us out in service, in mission, <laughs> Jesus is already there. Hudson Taylor, the, the founder of that missions agency that was eventually called OMF, Overseas Missionary Fellowship, Hudson Taylor once said, Go into all the world and you will find Jesus at the ends of the earth. Feed the hungry, he said, and you will meet Jesus there. Rescue the oppressed and you will find Jesus there. Deliver the captives and you will see Jesus there. Before Hudson Taylor really pulled together this vision of, of, of reaching the millions and millions in China with the good news of Jesus, he, he began to pray about that challenge. And he felt God say to him, Hudson Taylor, I'm not calling you to follow me. I'm calling you to join me. You see, that is the reality of mission and service in our world. We get involved in what God, by his spirit, is already doing. He doesn't say, follow me. He says, join me. That's the work of the spirit in mission. Finally, Scripture, the Spirit of truth, Jesus calls the Holy Spirit there back in chapter 16 and verse 13. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. The Spirit is to be the ongoing channel of the truth about Jesus in the lives of these disciples Jesus puts it like this in, in the previous chapter. The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you things and will remind you of everything that I have said to you. That is the Spirit's role. And because the Spirit has that role, we have this book, the Bible. The Spirit of God hits the recall button in the hearts and minds of these disciples and and brings to their memory and then to their writing all the necessary truth about Jesus. And people like us down through the centuries have come to know and love Christ as he has walked off the pages of Scripture to meet them. That's the Spirit's job. So that when, when we pick up this book when you study this book, you have the inspired, authoritative, God-breathed gospel. As the Spirit's doing, he takes the Word of God and plants the truth of God into the lives of the people of God. Who is the Holy Spirit? What is the Holy Spirit? A young boy was flying a kite high above a cliff and he extended the string so the kite went really, really high. But it disappeared behind the clouds and a fog came down and couldn't see the, the kite anymore. A, a man was walking past and said to the boy, hey, what are you doing? I'm flying a kite, said the boy, but you can't see the kite. I know, said the boy, but I can feel the tug of the string. There are a number of categories that in the Bible describe the ministry of the Holy Spirit. 
the breath of God, the wind of God, the fire of God. But above all, the Holy Spirit is not a something, but a someone. And yes, rather like that kite, sometimes we can't see the Spirit, but we can feel the pull, the pull of his ministry, his, his work, his energy, his creativity in our lives. And on, on this Pentecost Sunday, isn't it important for us as church to celebrate the reality of the God we worship who is Father, Son, and Spirit, King of heaven, majesty living in me. May we feel the pull of God's Spirit in our lives as, as, as we serve in mission, as the Spirit spotlights Jesus, as the Spirit this week assures you, whoever you are, that you're triple lock secure, that you can call the God of the universe Father. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, living breath of God, breathe new life into my willing soul. Bring the presence of the risen Lord to renew my heart and make me whole. Cause your word to come alive in me. Give me faith for what I cannot see. Give me passion for your purity. Holy Spirit, breathe new life in me. Amen.